Hey, good morning, everybody. I appreciate you coming uh, this early on Friday morning to spend a little time with us, but we wanted to uh, just take a time and, and go through the, the app, Survey123, and, and kind of the operation of it in South Carolina. Um, most of you may know that over the past two years, we've used it um, during hurricane season. And then this year, we had a uh, tornado season uh, come into South Carolina and used it quite a bit. So um, South Carolina Task Force One uh, and the entire Emergency Response Task Force has um, taken Survey123 as our, our primary assessment tool. Um, our regional SAR teams, when they're deployed, we have um, passed that out before and, and they've used it. We've given it out to local fire departments and even our federal uh, USAR response teams that come into South Carolina have used it in the past and now all 28 FEMA teams are using it. Um, so it's really become a continuity of operations for us. SCEMD has gotten heavily involved with us um, and Charlie Kaufman from SCEMD has been able to take it and place into Palmetto and that's maintaining just one common operating picture, which is great. So as we move forward, this is gonna be our standard template for search and rescue in South Carolina. Um, we have plans to issue each regional team um, some logins. So there will be a kind of a level playing field for search and rescue in South Carolina. And at the end of the day, we're, we're getting data, real-time data in, um, maintaining one common operating picture and being able to give information to local and state level decision makers in a very timely fashion. So that's why we're here. I uh, really appreciate your time uh, today. And uh, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to uh, any of us on the call during it or afterwards. And uh, hope you enjoy it. All right, this is Paul Darty here. I'm a colleague at Chad. I work for the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. And I just wanna give you a quick overview. Uh, this asynchronous tabletop exercise, meaning you don't have to all be doing it at the same time, um, is gonna have four parts. This webinar is just kicking it off and it'll be recorded and can be disseminated to the entire community. Part two will be uh, independent field exercise, meaning between, you have between now and July 2nd. And what that also means is you have no excuse not to participate because we're giving you plenty of time. Um, you can use it uh, while out on shift or you can designate time with your team to work on it and uh, Chad can maybe go through some of those details later. Uh, part three will be a field exercise after action review. This will just be a chance for us to get together again and discuss uh, what was planned, what went well, and maybe what you know, didn't go as expected or, or you think means improvement. And then part four will be a facilitated discussion with the emergency management division. Obviously we're focused on uh, life safety first in search and rescue, but we recognize that a lot of the information we collect can benefit other organizations and, and ultimately, uh, you know, the citizens in the community for recovery. So that's how this will all go down. Uh, the overall objectives and, you know, we developed these in conjunction with Chad and, and by working across a lot of different search and rescue teams, including uh, FEMA and, and your, your neighbors around in the Southeast. But basically by the end of this exercise, participants will have demonstrated the technical capability to plan and collect field data. You'll demonstrate an understanding of the wide area search process. I know that a lot of us take classes on wide area search, but this is a chance to actually practice it. Um, one of the benefits of this exercise, you'll collect some pre-incident planning for your area. Uh, this is probably of great interest to you, particularly if you're on a heart or a helicopter rescue team. Um, it's a chance to go and mark up all the LZs in your response area. Um, and if you live in a, you know, a, in the low country, maybe some of your casualty collection points. So places that are typically high water, you've used them before, or you know for a fact that those are usually uh, safe places to bring people. Uh, these are things you can do as pre-planning. We'll save the data and give it back to you. And so that's something um, of benefit from this exercise that maybe you won't get out of some of the others. Um, and a really big objective, you know, statewide is how do we use the information that first responders see in the field and turn it into initial damage assessment? In other words, can we, can we understand the initial impacts of a disaster in a county to know if they're going to need um, state or even federal support as soon as possible? Um, and obviously, the initial damage assessment can feed into the preliminary damage assessment, which really helps our, uh, our communities recover. 
And then finally, uh, it's a chance to talk about how the data will move and who should have access to it and when. And so it's something that um, you know, Chad and his colleagues at South Carolina Emergency Management Division are paying close attention to because we wanna make sure that the important uh, information gets to who needs it and that we don't, um, but that the data stays protected and that in particular uh, things like rescues and uh, victim detected and all that information doesn't, doesn't get exposed publicly, but that we can share the damage data as widely as possible. So those are their overall objectives. Um, today, I just wanna give a quick overview of a game plan that we've been developing with the, with the team at the state. Um, a lot of it comes from workshops we've done with many of you. And um, I hope that you uh, approve of this game plan or we can make modifications to it as part of the after action review. Uh, you'll get an intro, especially from Jared on how the tools work. We've got a lot of uh, training materials for you. Most of this stuff is pretty easy but the sooner you get hands-on and the sooner you actually use it in a, a real world environment, the more comfortable you'll be when you know, the disaster comes. And then we'll talk a little bit about the field exercise itself and, and uh, what Chad's expecting from all you um, to complete the mission. I won't spend too much time on this, but if you're wondering who we are, uh, Jared, myself, and some of uh, my other buddies on the call here, we work for the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. Um, that's an acronym that we call NAPSIG Foundation, and we are a nonprofit, have been established of uh, many different public safety agencies who've all agreed a, a geospatial approach, in particular in uh, a first responders world, is, is incredibly important. So everything we do is inherently spatial, needs maps, but we want to get better and better at disasters because they're not going away and they seem to be getting more, more complex. So we have a vision of, you know, every community has this capability that you're gonna demonstrate uh, over the next few weeks. But we feel that South Carolina is well out ahead of using this national standard for data collection. Uh, you, you've been going through exercise and simulations. Uh, this will be the first time we've done sort of an asynchronous exercise. So I'm pretty excited to see how it goes. Uh, we're gonna provide the education and training you need. We've already pre-recorded videos um, and then we are gonna be around for some of the tech assistance. So if you run into issues, uh, we'll talk about chain of command, but um, Chad and Kevin will help to kind of triage what the issues are and we'll do some digging to find out what it is. Um, I'd rather you break things now than during a disaster. And so that's really what NAPSIC does. Um, this is just an opportunity to work closely with South Carolina through a, a grant that we have. And this is our second year. And um, we're hoping a year from now, we work ourselves out of a job and you don't even remember who we are. So. But I want to start with uh, a metaphor, and I hope, uh, I hope a football metaphor works at South Carolina. Uh, forget for a second that this is the Detroit Lions, but um, just to see if anybody's awake, what are you seeing here? If there's anybody who really loves football, what do you think I'm trying to demonstrate? I'm showing the huddle, and then the huddle's disappearing. I should have planted the answer for uh, Chad. It's pretty early, but you know, in football, we've, we've used the huddle for many, many years, right? The huddle is how we decide what we're going to do next. But what we're seeing in today's football is actually the huddle is disappearing, right? We're moving to a no huddle offense. Uh, yep. I knew someone would say something about the Detroit Lions. Yes. They haven't won a championship in 50 years. Um, but what we're seeing is, uh, teams are adapting, right? They know their game plan so well in advance and they are probably using a lot of technology to achieve it that they're able to get ahead of their defense, right? Or ahead of the disaster and it, it's an advantage. So it may look chaotic to us as fans, but they know exactly what's going on at least most of the time. And, you know, in public safety, we need a game plan, right? You all form game plans for technical operations for helicopter rescue. Well, taking a geospatial approach to disaster is really that game plan so that we don't get in each other's way or so that we don't repeat efforts or so that we don't miss survivors. And we really believe at NAPSIG and, and now with uh, Chad here at South Carolina that a geospatial approach is a way to win against disasters and that we actually need to develop our geospatial game plan. So not to put too much pressure on you, but you know, it starts with identifying your team uh, for emergency management agencies, it's really complex, right? Your team is the public, first responders, emergency managers, GIS specialists. 
you know, your local weather office. And I think for first responders, you know, you're part of that larger team and knowing what your needs are uh, allows us to support you. Once you've identified your team, you need to, you need to kind of identify what we call core info needs. It's, it's the data or the information you need at the right time in the right place to make decisions. And we've outlined a lot of those based off of all of our experience working through wider research. And we're gonna work with you to practice this and, and identify if there's additional core information needs. And then we develop a game plan to address it. And we test it and we refine it and we get better at every single disaster. And so that's what we're talking about here today. If I say geospatial game plan, that's, that's really what we're referring to. Uh, the team for your exercise and for this hurricane season is everybody from the South Carolina Emergency Response Task Force to the individual SAR teams, uh, local first responders. You know, you may not be on a search and rescue team, but your neighborhood floods. Um, the Emergency Management Division. Uh, NAPSIG is playing a large role in the GIS staff. Uh, we got Charlie from the Emergency Management Division, but we really want to involve more of your people who focus on maps every day and get them involved in first responder operations. So this is a chance to get them engaged because you're going to need them uh, one day. So you might as well make friends with them now and get them involved in the exercise. Uh, the FEMA response office is paying attention, uh, both at the national level and hopefully at the regional level. And you got NAPSIG backing you up and also the International Association of Fire Chiefs, who's been a really strong advocate for this approach and, and really promulgated this across many disasters and are pushing from a USAR committee standpoint now to make sure that uh, every team in the country has these tools, not just uh, South Carolina. So core info needs for wide area search. You know, uh, what's really been identified through the years is, you know, we need to see points on the map, waypoints, right, our observations, uh, track logs, which are really just a way to show coverage, right? I'm not so interested in the squiggly lines that show up on the map, but we want to know what's been covered and assignment areas. And this is something that's often not used. Um, I see a lot of uh, plan section chief focusing on their 204s and typing up documents only to realize that maybe the documents need a map. Um, we'd like to flip that around and actually start with a map um, and really focus on uh, having a geospatial approach. And in many cases, you could pre-plan the attack in your community, right? It's hard with something like a tornado, but for a flood, you probably know what areas need to be um, assigned first. And then finally, uh, base data, like something that GIS people know a lot about, but if you don't know them or what they do, you may not know that things exist, like flood areas, right? Or areas that have flooded before, or building footprints, or, um, I don't know. I'm pretty sure South Carolina, uh, if you talk to Charlie, he's got a map of just about everything you can think of. So we want to collect what it is that you want to know in order to do your job better. Um, that's base data and live feeds are things like, you know, everything from radar to stream gauges to data that we don't have to manipulate. It just shows up on the map. So I hope that helps explain a little bit about GIS. If you've uh, paid attention to this slide, you've just passed uh, GIS 101. So waypoints, uh, this is the standard set of waypoints that's been used by search and rescue, in particular FEMA, for, uh, for quite a long time. And these were associated with GPS units and uh, some specialized icons they put together. The waypoints that we have pushed into the system you're gonna use is based off of that history of iron sites. It uses the same observations because these were important to you before and they're probably important to you going into the future. Um, based on feedback from working group uh, that includes some of your, your friends here in South Carolina. Uh, we've added just a few more to make, uh, to make the, the set complete. And there's always extra icons that can be added in. But these are basically your observations in the field. And the really key groupings are human interactions. Uh, these are the ones focused on the people and are probably the ones that need to be shared just with, uh, just with the first responder community or, or those that need to see it. Hazards, which probably should be shared with everybody. Structures, uh, structure damage, which does need to be shared with care because uh, we don't want people to misinterpret the map. But this is something that by partnering with your emergency management agencies, you can really get a lot of work done uh, very, very quickly. And then finally, there's sort of an other category. And this is a mix of incident support and those extra icons that we talked about. But in particular, you know, marking up your helicopter landing sites, you don't have to wait for a disaster to do that. 
Um, and like I said, casualty collection points. So there's a bit of pre-planning that can be done in here and uh, we encourage you to do so. I'm gonna pause there for a second. I know I speak really fast um, and I just wanna see if we're all caught up and how's audio and visual, Jared? Everything's good. All right, cool. So, you know, uh, it helps to make diagrams. This is something that Jared and I have sort of like put on a whiteboard a number of different times and now we just put some uh, some symbols there. But, you know, when we're trying to translate what we're doing outside the first responder community is, you know, we've got those four groups of uh, data that we collect. That should be shared across all, the entire first responder community, right? So we would have to, ultimately we wanna integrate with all the systems that first responders are using, even the police. Um, and, you know, really the, in a disaster, we have an incident command system, we have an incident command post. So they need to see all the data and be able to access it in a way that they can make decisions. A uh, common example is, has this neighborhood been covered yet or not? We wanna see those observations. Um, now, emergency management, they can benefit from seeing all the data, but there are times, especially going to recovery, where they are really focused on the damage you observed both the points and the photos. And so we talk about, you know, we should also integrate with the EOC and rather than send them a spreadsheet of what we've done, they can actually see it on a live map. And so it's really about situational awareness in this community. And, um, you know, this is almost the game plan on one slide. Um, these are gonna be charts for your reference. Uh, so if you wanna go back and kind of read up on, you know, what are we doing for human interactions? What does it answer? And how is the data collected? We kind of put like from a field and an incident command standpoint. And then for your GIS specialist uh, and even you, we talk a little bit about the technology being used for each of these categories. So this is sort of a reference chart, but you'll see here, there's an operational game plan, which needs to be known in the field. Um, and then there's sort of the technical game plan that people on the back end, like your GISers and your, your IT people and Charlie at SEMD and, and us, we really need to be aware of to make sure that we can support you in the field. So when it comes to waypoints, the tool that we use first or, or foremost is Survey123, which is a field app that can be configured to be really like form centric. In other words, it looks like a survey and you just add the point so that we know where it happened. It's not necessarily an app we use a ton for navigation, although it has a map in it um, so, so that you have some reference. The point here is it allows you to collect lots of different types of info uh, without having to fill out a bunch of forms, right? You do it on your phone, it's done, and now it's recorded and it goes onto a map. And we use things like dashboards and other tools to monitor this and track this and make sure nothing slips through the cracks. Um, when it comes to your assignment areas and your track log, we're gonna stick with common, commonly used wide area search terminology. Um, these definitions are uh, available to you as sort of a data dictionary and will really help when you talk to non search and rescue professionals. But basically, a recon is exactly what it sounds like. A rapid search is a hasty search where we are probably going to be stopping to help victims that are easy to rescue and probably leaving behind those that require additional resources. Um, primary search is when we are actually uh, for accountability going door to door quickly. And secondary search is a systematic search of every room right? Uh, typically used in a structural collapse, but also, uh, you know, when we've saved all the living and we're going to look for human remains, you know, we're certainly getting into a higher uh, systematic search. And then targeted search. Targeted search could be any kind of mission that's specific. Um, in other words, you know, uh, Chad, things aren't too bad yet, but from an emergency management standpoint, we'd really like you to check on all the shelters just to make sure they're not flooded already. Or we'd really like you to check all the nursing homes or whatever type of special mission it is, we call that a targeted mission. Um, from an operational game plan standpoint for our tracks, we use, um, we use lines to show where we've been, right? And for that reason, we use a tool called Quick Capture, which Jared will show you, which I think will be your favorite because it's only got a few buttons and it's really easy to use. Uh, if nothing else, it's really good to show what you, where you've been uh, because assuming you're doing your job, you're not going to leave people behind if you've been there. So coverage is really important. Assignment areas, this is particularly important for your planning section, your SIT unit, and even ops. Uh, assignment areas are ways to just say, like, this is the area we're going to focus on today. And we can actually get some analytics from setting up these assignment areas, like how many buildings are there? 
approximately how long do we think it'll take? And I think that's really important advantage of taking a geospatial approach versus uh, being a, a slave to your instant action plan. Um, and then there's technology to back it up. So again, these are just kind of reference charts, uh, something that you can talk through uh, when you're having meetings. These will be available to you in the slides. So uh, you're gonna get oriented to these tools from Jared, but basically quick capture is for tracks primarily. You'll notice we've slipped, uh, in, some, in some cases we can provide buttons for waypoints. That would be more for like a recon or even um, a helicopter flyover where we don't want you to mess with survey one, two, three but really limited in uh, questions you can answer with this tool at this time. So it's primarily used for track logs. And you can see there, there's just big fat buttons and you'll know exactly what type of mission you're selecting. Um, and then there's the SAR Intel Manager, which is actually a, a map you use uh, from your computer that you can begin to plan and pre-plan the assignments and then check them off when they're done. Um, so if you are happy with how well this box is filled in with tracks, and you know, you've, dis you've debriefed with your team, you can say, you know, this area has been covered at least from a, a hasty search perspective. And then um, a tool that we, <clears throat> we use as sort of a, a common operating picture in the field, because it's hard to take a whole laptop with you, is a mobile app called Explorer. We typically will have like one uh, tablet in a vehicle or a boat pulled up with Explorer, just, just as a common operating picture to kind of see everything that's going on. Um, and it's also a really easy tool for taking offline maps. And so we, uh, when you get bored with all the other stuff, maybe you work with uh, a tech person on your team or the techiest person on your team, you can actually download some offline areas for your response area. I know we talk a lot about flooded and hurricanes in South Carolina, but imagine an earthquake if you're living down towards Charleston be a good idea to have all the base maps you need on your phone. Um, base data. This is probably uh, initially the most boring part of GIS, but actually it's been a game changer in a lot of your operations, whether you realize it or not. So for instance, having address points for a community or building footprints on your map beyond just imagery or beyond just a base map can be really, really valuable, especially when you're getting into that primary search, secondary search scenario. And so we want you to tease out what you think are important base data uh, when you go into these missions. This is just a screenshot from Seneca where, you know, we went from either imagery or, or a flat base map to, you know, actually we have address points. So we know now what, uh, based on what they put in their notes, exactly what they meant when they said 714 South Oak Street. So just some, just some concepts here, something to be thinking about as you go and maybe a good time to go over to your local GIS specialist and ask them, you know, what do you, what do you have uh, in your database for me to use? And then live feeds. The good news about live feeds is you don't really have to do much. You just consume them. Um, if you've used Palmetto, you'll see that Charlie and the team, they've got lots of live feeds for you in there. There's probably even more that you don't even know about. And um, again, if you get bored with the rest of the exercise, you can have a poke around a, a little library we put together of live feeds from across the United States. All right, so just taking a second here to talk a little bit about uh, damage assessment. Um, your primary mission as first responders is probably not thinking about financial uh, assessments of homes and recovery, but by sharing your observations, you're able to feed into a, a bigger picture. And so this is just a concept, but basically, you know, uh, during phase one, it might be primarily city and county fire and police uh, making observations in the field. We actually work with an organization called the GIS Corps who might be backing you up with uh, mapping photos from social media, right? Early on, uh, soon after uh, an event hits, you know, you might have limited information and limited resources. You move into phase two, you might be talking about working with, uh, you know, official search and rescue teams, uh, hopefully it's not big enough, but you might be working with FEMA teams and obviously you have a great relationship with your, your DOD friends. And so now we're moving into phase two, a little more organized, but we wouldn't want to throw away information collected in phase one, right? We want to know where first responders have already been. Phase three, it may be as safe to get out in the field. And now there's Red Cross and building inspectors that are gonna to wanna to use your information. There's actually uh, imagery providers that could be providing information in this phase. 
and we want to build off of the information as it's collected rather than duplicate. Um, and then ultimately, as we move into recovery, you know, um, if you're looking for federal assistance, you know, FEMA would love to have access to this information uh, so that they don't have to put boots on the ground everywhere and they can benefit from the photos and the data you've collected uh, to speed up their process. And then often we leave out the private sector, but think about all the utilities and businesses that support your communities. Um, being able to brief them off of this information is critical too. And, um, you know, not as important to a lot of us, uh, you know, down at the lower uh, end of the totem pole, but for a lot of people higher up, you know, we need to be able to brief go the governor's office, local government officials, uh, other state entities and local private sector. And so by doing this better, we gain confidence from all these stakeholders and we reduce duplication of effort. Um, when we talk about our game plan, we typically do it by phase. You know, the preparedness phase is in many ways time for training. It's time for the GIS nerds to get all the, uh, all the tools together and make sure they're ready for you. The readiness phase is when you're, you know, for a notice event is when uh, you're probably monitoring some live feeds, trying to understand where, where the impact's gonna be. It's a good time to issue what we're gonna call the battle card so that everybody's uh, logged in and ready to go with the, with the tools. And then there's the response phase. You're actually out in the field. Uh, that, that's gonna require that there's some technical support and you're going through your search and rescue phases and something that NAPSIG encourages is a, a daily call for geospatial coordination between the state, local, and federal. And then we move into recovery. What do we do with the data now? We've got to archive it, make sure it gets to the right people. And we're trying to, as much as possible, help with the damage assessment. Um, so we've got sort of a checklist here, and this is really um, for the internal team to kind of stay on the same page. We've got a, a little bit of a data sharing plan that we've been working through with, uh, in particular, uh, uh, Charlie at South Carolina Emergency Management Division to make sure that the data is accessible. Um, readiness, this is something Jared will talk about. Uh, we prepare battle cards to make sure you're going to the right apps um, and that you've got your username and password in front of you. This is sort of like your, your lifeline in the field that should get printed out and maybe plastered to the dashboard of the car. Uh, we're also sorting through how's everybody gonna access the information. Uh, if you're a South Carolina Task Force team member, uh, you're gonna have one level of uh, access to get in. Um, there'll be other people who wanna jump on through the mobilization program, so we're working out accounts for them. And then some of you are, you know, you're, you were ahead of the rest of South Carolina and you're already doing this uh, approach, so we don't wanna slow you down, we just wanna give you access so that we have a common operating picture. And so that's all the boring uh, tech stuff that we work out to uh, support you in advance. And then, as I said before, we move into the readiness phase where we're doing watches and warnings and uh, all that information is available to you already uh, through the Palmetto app and, and through these live feeds. Uh, response, this is probably the part you care the most about. So we're creating a little checklist here um, in particular for the, the GIS and the SIT unit to pay attention to. And, you know, big picture, it's, it's all about uh, you having a geospatial approach from beginning to end. It's important for you to be able to understand the phases of search and rescue if you haven't received any training. So again, here's some uh, reference materials. Um, it's important to be able to uh, use tools to create assignment areas so that you don't double up on coverage or miss areas altogether. And uh, during response, you know, life safety is the priority. So one of the things that we added based off of exercises and missions with you is the ability to flag any observation in the field with a category, 99% of them won't need follow-up because you're just marking an observation. But if there's something in the field that you can't resolve on your own, you can flag it as needs follow-up and that kind of pushes it into a tracking system so that nobody falls through the cracks. So if you were to, uh, let's say you were doing a recon and you saw that there were people uh, requiring a boat team, you could mark them as you know, victim detected or victim confirmed um, and keep moving and now it's up to your, uh, you know, your task force lead and your planning team to make sure that there's a plan to go back and retrieve those victims. And the reality is we'll see exactly where they, were, where they are and when you saw them. And so that's really important information. And then finally, recovery, right? The, the part where hopefully you all are getting back to your communities and getting back to your daily operations. It's the job of the GIS team and the emergency management team to archive the data, 
and integrate it into uh, you know, their decision support systems. So I hope that this all makes sense. Um, I think in order to engage the emergency management community, we need to have a game plan for damage assessment in particular. Um, like it or not, in emergency management, you know, recovery is where the money gets dispersed and that tends to be what a lot of the focus is on because you don't want to do it uh, unwisely. Um, and basically, you know, you all are focused on the structural integrity of a building. That's why we keep the language focused on that. So complete destruction of structure. It's high risk, which means I wouldn't, we, would, we will not go back in there unless we can uh, support it. Medium risk means it's moderately damaged. Uh, you aren't an expert, but you think it's going to need some work to, uh, for people to return back to that building. And then, you know, low risk, low probability of further collapse. You're not super interested in damage to like a facade or uh, something exterior to the building that's not going to affect the occupants. You might just mark it as, as no damage, indicating, you know, there's very little damage. And, um, you know, for preliminary damage assessment or initial damage assessment, uh, it's probably the right term. You know, destroyed is destroyed. If you can't see the house anymore, it's destroyed, right? And that's really helpful information for them to see and probably the easiest to interpret. Um, they use these additional categories to focus on, you know, what's going to be the financial impact to the community. But by using your photos and your rough definitions, they can actually begin this process uh, without even having to get into the field. And we think that's really important, especially for the, uh, the extremely large disasters where the, the field component's gonna take a lot of time. When it comes to photos, uh, we actually recommend when you're moving into the damage assessment phase, so life safety is done, you're doing a detailed door-to-door. Uh, -door. Uh, FEMA's got some good uh, recommendations for the photos that they need in order to make assessments. And you know, one of them is uh, you take one photo that shows why the damage category was chosen. So obviously you wanna be able to see most of the structure. And then one photo that gives it um, some geographic context. Uh, so, so again, think about how this works. If you're gonna take the one photo that shows why the damage category was chosen, if you chose no damage, you might just take one photo of a slight damage to a exterior of a building, right? Or if you chose moderate damage, show why you thought it was moderate damage. And then we really appreciate a secondary photo that gives it some geographic context so that you know, it has an address or at least um, you would know which house it is when you return there. Um, this has been really important. We worked through a, a quality control process with, uh, with the task force for the Seneca and Hampton County tornadoes. Um, this will be here for your reference, but basically we feel that as soon as you're moving into a damage assessment phase, you should make contact with the local GIS team. So that could be your plans manager, or if you have a GIS person on your team, they should make contact with the local. Um, field operations should begin to really uh, hone in where they're putting their points. And Jared will explain this, but basically you can drag a pin and put it right on top of a building or property. Uh, the SIT unit should use the Intel manager and app to inspect new entries as they come in to just kind of make sure that you're doing your job correctly and there aren't points all over the place in the middle of the street. And really your SIT unit or your plans team and the local GIS as much as possible should work together to uh, you know, plan the search uh, and the damage assessment to make sure that you know, there's no duplicate areas covered or that no areas are missed. So uh, based off of our experience in uh, South Carolina with recent tornadoes, if you don't drag the pin to a property, it really can't be used for the damage assessment. And so the motto is uh, drag the pin or do it again. The uh, quality control workflow we had to come up with last time worked. Uh, if, you, if you do happen to misfire and you put a damage assessment point in the middle of the street, it can physically be moved onto the property if we have some ev evidence. So if you had entered the address and uh, jotted it down in the comments or you took a really good photo, it can be cleaned up, but we wanna minimize this because we're trying to get high fidelity data to uh, those that need it as quickly as possible. So um, that's just kind of an understanding of the field apps. We'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the apps that can be used by the incident command post and the EOC in a little bit. But really, before we go forward uh, and talk about the exercise and the tools you're gonna use, you know, why is all this important? Uh, a geospatial approach allows us to understand where the impact's likely to be greatest. 
it helps us understand who's doing what, where, and when, and where is really important. Uh, where have we searched? Where have we not searched? Where do we need to do follow-up? That's really important. Where was the greatest impact? Now we're moving into damage assessment. And where can recovery begin, right? Because when all the life safety is taken care of and the damage has been sized up, it's really important to get people back in their homes and working. And I think getting off on the right foot with the work you're doing uh, can really help to do that. So with that, I will, uh, I'll pause here. This video will walk you through using the SAR and first responder field data collection form using Survey123. For this video, we'll use version seven of the template. To save time and confusion in the field, we recommend the tech info specialist prepares devices in advance for the field teams. If this is already done, you can skip ahead to the collect step. To access the survey, use your camera to scan the appropriate QR code for the survey from the Battle Carter hub site. In this example, we'll be using the NAPSIC sandbox, but the process will be similar for your own organization. If you do not already have Survey123 installed, you'll be prompted to install it. When you install Survey123 and all the ArcGIS apps, it's important to allow the app to access your location. Once Survey123 is installed, you'll need to sign into the survey if you want to access all the data. We recommend using a password storage app like LastPass and writing down your username and password in a safe place. Before you begin collecting data, you need to ensure that the map settings are configured correctly. To do that, click on your profile icon in the upper right corner, select settings, and then map. Make sure that the standard beta is selected as you see here. This step is subject to change with software updates, but that's the status as of July 2020. If for some reason you don't have a QR code to access the survey, you can follow these steps for downloading the correct survey. If you're already signed in with Survey123 and the survey creator shared the survey with you, you can click Download Surveys at the bottom, locate the appropriate survey, and click the Download button. Your GIS specialist should explain to you what the title of the survey is and how to verify it's correct. Double check that you're using the right survey for data collection. If you're using a device from your cache, ideally your tech info specialist or GIS specialist has already set up your device, in which case you can start the video here. All of this should have already been set up for you. You can now go back and access the survey. To open the survey, click Collect. The very top section can be expanded to show the data dictionary, explaining what each waypoint symbol represents. It includes a QR code to share the survey with someone else nearby, and instructions for creating a favorites draft to expedite repeated data collection, which we'll show you in a moment. Just remember this is here. It's helpful tips and tricks. Before you begin formal data collection, I'll demonstrate the process for creating a favorites draft with event details to be used during subsequent data collection. Once you complete these five fields, go to the overflow or sometimes called the hamburger button in the upper right and select set as favorite answers. Next, close the survey by clicking on the X in the upper left corner. Select save this survey in drafts. This ensures that you can go back to this draft later and your favorites are stored on the device. Now you'll notice that you have an orange symbol for drafts on the main screen for the survey. This is merely showing that you have a favorites draft. You do not need to do anything with this for now. To actually begin data collection, click collect. Once the new survey opens, click the overflow button in the upper right and choose paste answers from favorites. You'll do this every time you fill out a form and it will speed up data entry. Next, you need to set the location for your observation. You can do this by using your device's GPS by clicking the crosshairs in the upper left corner. This will place the new waypoint where you're standing. If using this method, make sure you're standing close to your observation, not in the middle of the street, 
and check the accuracy. If you're having issues with accuracy, try going into airplane mode. Sometimes the cell networks can actually interfere with your device's location. If you're doing a damage survey, you should always place the pin on the building that you are assessing. To do this, click on the map. This opens the map, and from here, be sure to change the base map to one that shows building footprints. In this case, we'll use the web map that shows our waypoints and tracks that our GIS specialist set up. Then drag the crosshairs on top of the appropriate building footprint. Select the check mark in the lower right to set this location. This will only work if you are online or if you have access to an offline base map. Please note, you can also search for addresses when you are online, but you may still need to adjust the pin and confirm the location. When you're done, close the map. Under the map, you'll notice the US National Grid, MGRS, and decimal degree minute coordinates for the pin you just dropped. These provide a quick reference if you need to call something in over the radio. Below that, you'll need to select the appropriate waypoint. Note, this is a smart form, so the questions following the waypoint will change depending on which waypoint you choose. In this example, we're surveying a damaged hospital that is high risk, so we'll select structure failed. Notice you can use a type ahead to filter your options once you get the hang of this and are familiar with the choices. Below, you have the option to input some comments and type the address of the building if known. This can be a helpful reference when entered from the field. If you put your points in the right location, this can also be reverse geocoded afterwards by a GIS specialist. You can also select the structure type, which is helpful for others that might be following up with initial damage assessment or structural engineers that need to assess the building for safety. The damage comments may also be useful. I'll add a quick comment here about the type of damage. This isn't meant to be an exhaustive survey. Next, you can note if this waypoint needs follow-up. If it does, then you can mark the follow-up priority here, and others in the command post in EOC will see this and have to take action on it. And then you can quickly add some follow-up comments. Finally, you can note if this waypoint is related to a FEMA community lifeline. Since this is a hospital, we'll select yes, and note that's related to the health and medical lifeline. Finally, you have the option to attach up to three photos. For damaged buildings, be sure to get a photo that gives some geographic context, such as an address or other landmark if possible. And a photo that shows why the damage category was chosen. You are now ready to submit your observation. Click the check mark in the lower right corner. If you're in a connected environment, then you can just click send now. Alternatively, if you're working offline, you can select Save this survey in the outbox. In this case, on the main screen of the survey, you now have a green outbox. Once you return to an area of service or connect to Wi-Fi, click the outbox and then click Send. This will submit all your waypoints stored in the outbox. Be sure to do this at the end of each operational period or the data you collected will not be synced with the master layer. The example we just showed was detailed to show you how the survey might work during a primary, secondary, or targeted search. For a hasty search, you might skip damage assessment altogether and simply focus on victims and hazards, entering just the details needed for your mission. These types of surveys take just seconds to complete, and you may even be able to call it in over the radio while someone else completes the survey if your hands are full. This will be up to your task force lead and should be listed in your incident action plan or your rules of engagement. Thank you all for watching this overview video. Remember, Survey123 can be configured for many mission types, and this is simply the wide area search template developed by the NAPSIG Foundation SAR Working Group. Thank you. Quick Capture is going to be our tracks. So uh, when you first install Quick Capture, uh, you're going to get a dialog that pops up that asks uh, when to use your location. And you want to be sure to click uh, Always Use Your Location. Um, if you don't, when you close the app, uh, it will stop recording. This is especially important with Android devices. Um, so just make sure you say always use your location. Uh, and when you open it, uh, you can use the QR code reader or this little 
button down here to browse projects. I've already downloaded this one. This is one uh, we're using for South Carolina. So we'll, we can open it. Then you want to put in your team name. So I'm going to be NAPSIG1. And now this is probably the, the simplest app of all of them to use. Uh, all you have to do is your, if you pick the type of search that you're tasked with, if it's primary, I'm going to tap primary. And again, it's because I'm uh, using this reflector app. Um, but you just tap it, it'll start flashing. And then uh, you can switch apps and go to the other one and uh, go on. Um, uh, go on with your operation. And then when you're done, you just open it back up, you tap primary again, and it will uh, stop um, recording your tracks. Uh, there's also this little drop down here. Uh, this is continuous points, and these automatically send as you're uh, moving. Uh, so you can click that and, and they can see where you're at uh, during the operation. And uh, the last field app I'm going to talk about today is Explorer, as Paul talked about before. We use this kind of as our um, common operational picture. And here is one that um, I download, downloaded an offline area for. So this is around Greenville. And so I downloaded this area here. So you can zoom in and you can still use this in an offline environment. And one thing to note, though, is once you take it offline, uh, None, as points are being added and updated, uh, you won't see that in here because it, it is an offline. Uh, so this is something you could do at the beginning of an operational period. And then before you start the next one, if you're in an area of connectivity, uh, you can refresh and re-download and update all the points. All right, I'm now gonna switch gears and I'm gonna show some of the supporting apps that you can use on uh, in the web browser. And to begin with, uh, probably the main page you're wanna, going to want to know, and this is on the, um, the battle card. This is the hub page for uh, the South Carolina Emergency, Emergency Response Task Force hub page. And this, this has all the information you need for all the apps. Uh, so this has QR codes for the three apps I just went through and links to them, as well as links to uh, the applications to use on your computer that I'm getting ready to go through right now. And so the first one I wanna show is the tactical dashboard. And this one is, um, this one can be used in your, in your incident command post um, so that you can follow along as people are out in the field collecting data. And as they send in information, if they mark it as needs follow up or assigned, they'll show up in these columns here and you can, um, the, the thought is, at the end of the day, you want everything to be cleared out of your needs follow up and assigned. And so if we have this victim here, we can see what it is. We can read about uh, what, what is actually going on there. And then you can actually edit that survey by clicking that button. And this is where you can come and you can change the column uh, that's actually in. So we're going to assign this. And submit it. Um, and when you're assigning it, you're not, this doesn't actually say, um, it's not a tasking. Thing. It's just a way for, for you to keep track of what is assigned and what's not assigned. So you'd be using your radios uh, to actually assign that task to someone. And now you can see it moved over to assign. And then once it's completed, you, do, you follow the same steps and move it over into completed. A couple things I'd like to note for people using this. Uh, here you can filter these points by uh, priority. You can also filter them uh, if you want to just see human interactions or you want to see the hazards in the area or all of them. 
There's also a hidden side panel here with this little uh, triangle. And this is where you can filter by team. And so if you're just wanting to see what uh, Task Force One is doing, you can do that and see their points. You can also filter by date. So as the operation goes into multiple days and you only want to see what's going on today, uh, you, can, you can do that here. Uh, down here, this is where all the tracks and assignments also show up. Once they get put in, this, uh, this is uh, pretty clear clean right now, there's not a whole lot of points in here. And moving on. Sorry, the controls are in the way. I'm trying to switch to the next app. Uh, one more dashboard to show. This is the SAR summary dashboard. So the other one's a little more tactical at the task force level. This one would be more for emergency management um, or perhaps uh, your mayor or governor. They just want to know what's going on, how many waypoints there are, and only things that have been approved at the task force level show up on this dashboard. Uh, next, we have the SAR Intel Manager. And this was uh, what Paul had uh, kind of briefly discussed earlier. This is where we can actually go about planning our search mission and help us figure out um, kind of the, the, the amount of effort that it will take to search an area. Uh, so across here at the top, there's different tools. Uh, this one is the Smart Editor. And this is where you can create points and assignment areas. Uh, so right now I'm gonna create um, a search segment here. You can then uh, say what kind of search it is, uh, the status, write who is uh, going to be assigned to it. And then you can You also can come in here and as Paul was talking about, uh, there's some calculations that are run. So within this search area, there's approximately 88 buildings. And there's also calculations for how many waypoints are in that area. So as waypoints start coming in, this number will automatically be changed. And then you can see a, a, a rough estimate of how long it would take to, to do this at five minutes per building. And, and as you guys are working through in the next couple of weeks, uh, I'd be interested to, to kind of hear how accurate these are so that we can tweak these calculations uh, to be more accurate. A couple of the other tools I'll highlight very quickly. Um, layer list, so this is where you can turn layers on and off. Base map gallery, you can change it so you can have uh, imagery or um, some other base map. There's a US National Grid overlay. The uh, live feeds that Paul was talking about, you can add that here. So. Um, there's active hurricanes that you can add and a bunch of different layers for you to look through here. And also uh, the other tool you guys will probably use the most is the batch attribute editor. So as you are in here looking around, you're looking at all these points, you say, yes, they all look good. You can take this tool, select all those waypoints, and then you can set them as you can change the status so you can set these to approved and now they'll show up on the EOC dashboard. And finally, uh, yeah, so just get in here and play with this uh, during your operation. Uh, we've learned that it's, it's really good to have someone um, monitoring this as the operation's going on uh, so they can see if waypoints are ending up in the middle of the street or if they need to be moved to the top of a building. And the very last thing I want to point out is this is the Survey123 um, analysis page. And a link to this can be found off um, the Hub site as well. But this is an, a very easy way for you to um, get in, just kind of analyze the numbers, kind of the raw numbers. So if you need to do daily reports of the number of, of waypoints, this is a place you can go do that. And you can also uh, get a quick gallery image of all the pictures that have been taken.
going to transition back to the PowerPoint and we can discuss the exercise. All right, so for, um, and Chad, feel free to, to chime in here, um, but over the next approximately two and a half weeks, um, you guys will be tasked with uh, doing an, an independent exercise in your own area. Um, and the scenario is there's a hurricane coming, um, there's damaged buildings, flooding, hazards, people trapped everywhere. Um, so you guys are able to go out and, um, and, and do your own exercise, but there's several tasks that we wanna make sure that you guys uh, do. Um, first is familiar, familiarize yourself with the hub page. Again, that's the page with all the links on it. Make sure you understand where to find uh, the field apps and the um, apps on the computer. Um, use the SAR Intel Manager to draw search segments. Also look at some of those analytics, uh, look at the number of buildings, uh, look at the time frame. Is that going, is that time, um, estimated time, is that, is that true? Is that really how long it took you to do it? We want you to use quick capture. Um, maybe send one team out to do a quick recon walking the area. Um, and then follow that up with a primary search of the designated area where you use survey one, two, three to collect the waypoints. And then go back and do a second, a more uh, in-depth secondary search uh, to follow up on some of those waypoints that needed follow up um, from the previous primary search. We also want you to use ArcGIS Explorer uh, for situational awareness. So that's the, the map I showed you with all the points to see where you're at. Um, and you can see all the tracks and stuff as well. And then be sure to have a dedicated person when you're doing the exercise, have somebody, a dedicated person back looking at all the, the computer apps that I showed you um, and monitoring. That way they can do real-time QA, QC. They can also um, kind of get a full picture of the event as it's unfolding. And then finally use the one, survey123 analysis page to scan through pictures and some of the data. Uh, earlier this week, California Task Force 6 uh, conducted an exercise similar to this. Uh, this is a residential area that they went to um, and walked around and, and put waypoints. As you can see, um, they started out with a lot of waypoints in the middle of the street. And then uh, the person back in the incident command post uh, was like, hey, make sure you guys put these on the buildings. And then from then on, they started doing a, a better job of that. Um, and so you can kind of see. Um, the type of exercise we're, we're hoping that you guys will accomplish. And it, it really does help if you go into a residential area or an, a, an area with actual buildings. So you can practice dragging that pin to the top of a building footprint, as opposed to just uh, using cards and, and walking around a parking lot. Um, as we're doing this exercise over the next two and a half weeks, uh, if there is a real world incident um, at the local or regional level, um, please contact uh, Chad Beam um, and he'll get a hold of uh, Kevin or I and we will clean out the uh, practice data and you guys can start using it real world. If it's a statewide event, a uh, similar scenario, um, hurricane starts heading your way, Chad will um, let us know and we will clean out the data so you can use it uh, for real world uh, operations. Uh, for those of you who do not have a login yet or need access to the survey or as you're doing the, um, your exercise, you need technical support, contact Chad and uh, Chad will um, help you guys with your logins or um, uh, triage the, the, the technical difficulties and uh, get with Kevin uh, or the NAPSIG team and we can help you out. Um, so uh, kind of wrapping up what's next um, over the next two and a half weeks, uh, we hope you guys go out and conduct your independent exercise. Uh, following that, um, we're, we will host uh, an exercise AAR on June 2nd, so we can come back together and hear from you guys what went well, what didn't. And um, we're also gonna be doing a, a facilitated discussion with um, emergency management. Uh, this date and time is yet to be determined. Uh, so I apologize on that, but um, that's a potential time. But uh, within the next week, we'll have that schedule. All right, with that, um, I know we've been monitoring the chat during this, um, but are there any other, are there any outstanding questions from the chat or any um, 
questions that people would uh, have right now. Yeah, Jared, there was one outstanding question from Steve regarding the team filter you showed on the overall dashboard and how that is based on. Is it based on the survey one, two, three team assignment? Yeah, yeah, that is uh, that filter is based on the survey one, two, three survey. Uh, so if you remember when I went through the um, at the very beginning where we set our favorites and I selected the, te the team from the drop down and I chose out of state, um, that that is where that um, that com that filter comes from. So if your team is from uh, task force one and you choose that in your survey, um, when you come back to the dashboard, um, that filter you choose task force one and then your points will be the ones displayed. Right, is that any more questions? Um, feel free to, if you also, um, at this time you can unmute yourself and, and also ask questions if you'd like. All right, hearing none, um, I think that wraps it up. Um, we will be um, sending out the recording of this so you guys can use it for um, training. And if anybody from your team wasn't able to attend, uh, you can use that. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording.